Okay. Um, maybe the sec one of the secret is I was I thought I was uh, um, writing about myself, and you know I, I wrote many books about the history of my, the history of my family. Uh, I'm coming from my both my parents were Holocaust survivors, Jews in France during the war, and they escaped um, Auschwitz, but. L many members of their family, of our family, uh, went to death camp, and uh, there were a lot of silence about it after the war. And I was e educated in a family where no one would talk about that. So I had to vote book, many books, to understand what happened to my mother, my father, my grandparents, the co the, their cousin, and co and uh, so. I, and I was writing these books of mine about my life in Paris. I thought I was. Uh, separated from that, that it was over. I, I already did, it, did that story and I could uh, write about something else um, away from the war. And finally, um, I realized that the history of my parents in a, is a, in a clandestine way is in the book. For instance, uh, when I speak about the abortion I had when I was 17, um, I remember that my mother never touched me, never said anything to me. Um, I can't remember my mother gave me a kiss. And I think you can feel that, the silence of my mother in 17. Uh, when I came back from the abortion, I was with my father and my mother was in her home. She didn't get out of the home. She didn't say anything. And, um, and now I know that during the war, she was hiding in a convent for a few months. And that's where she had a menstruation for the first time. And she thought she was, she didn't know what it was about, all this blood. And she thought maybe she was going to, to die. And, um, and I think this hidden story is one of the secrets of the book. There's others, but for instance, uh, there's a story, it's a swimming story, it's a love story. Um, and, uh, uh, I say how oh, I met him is because our, uh, our both our mother, our mother uh, met in a high school reunion. You know, they had to, they were preparing the school trip, and so the headmaster said that the mothers had to sleep together in the same room and choose someone they could sleep with, uh, share a bedroom. And for for my mother, it was a, a lot of. Um, she was very anxious to share her bedroom with someone she didn't know. It was something for her difficult to accept. And suddenly she saw this woman, she looked at her and they look at each other and say, we're going to share her bedroom. They didn't know anything about each other. But in fact, they realized they had the same story. They were both Jewish, they both uh, had the same fear. And um, so I think our reunion came from this silence and hidden past uh, that no one could speak about. So this is one of the secrets of the book, but there's others of Maybe some I haven't discovered yet. Well, <clears throat> I feel like silence is one of the book's big themes. And for people who are listening who have not had a chance to read, this is a collection of three novellas that are thematically linked. The character, like the Cologne character is present throughout. This is very much autofiction, as we call it here in the United mm -hmm. States. Is there a corollary word for autofiction in France? We, we said autofiction. I don't know if it's autofiction. You know, each, I, I, I think each book you have to invent your own formula. You know, I use my life as a material. Uh, I, I'm very sincere when I'm writing, but as maybe unconsciously way when you write, you invent, you change, you make literature, you make fiction, you, you, you do a narrative. So maybe it's part memoir, part of the fiction, part fiction. It's, it's a mix of, of that and you have a, a secret formula for each book. And so for this one, you have three novellas. The first, which you mentioned, is called Seventeen, and it is about an abortion you had at age 17. Uh, the second is uh, called Friendship, and it's about your friendship with your uh, departed friend, Eloise, who died of cancer. And the third novella is called Swimming, and it is a love story about uh, a relationship that Cologne, the Cologne character has with a man named Gabriel, where they sort of fall head over heels for each other, but then eventually end up breaking up. So that novella is kind of a 
retrospective on that relationship. And when we talk about silence as a main theme, I guess we'll start with the abortion and the manner in which silence is often very much a part of the experience of having an abortion, maybe particularly so for a girl, for a young woman who is not yet on her own as an adult. This was the case for you. Like you say, your your father uh, had one response, your mother had a different response, and you felt very isolated. Yes, very much. And yeah, as you say, it's for, I think, every woman who has an abortion. You know, when the book was published in France, I was surprised because one of a woman who, who talked who read, who read it or, or told me or reached me, told me I had an abortion, I never say it to anyone, you know. Um, and the same with men. I had men reaching me saying I had my girlfriend, wife, company, I had an abortion and I never said it to anyone. Like, it's like something shameful. It's not a shame. It's a very difficult choice you made, you, you're making. It's a, it's a life choice, but it's not a shame. Um, and because we are ashamed of it, because we think, because it's taboo, because uh, we think of it as a failure. Once again, it's not a failure. It's not a shame. It's a huge decision. It's not something else, but it's not a shame. Maybe because we think that way, uh, first the law can disappear. This is what is, is happening now in the U.S. and other countries. So to speak out is to way. It's a way to fight for this free choice and to say, I'm not ashamed. I had an abortion. And because of this abortion, I was able to have the life I needed to be. I, I was able to be a good mother to my children because I was ready to have children. And at 17, I would have been a very bad mother. And you dedicated this novella to Annie Erno, who was very influential in yes. especially specifically with respect to this story. Yes, because she, she said several things which uh, lead me to write the story. First, she said that because women never say they have the abortion, the law can disappear. So I think she was pointing a, a finger at me, saying, Colombia had an abortion. You were able to study, to travel, to become a mother, and you never acknowledge this, this right. Okay. So you have a responsibility. But also, she said, and this was a, one of the other reasons I, I wrote the book, she said that when she published the event, uh, the, uh, her, her book about the uh, um, illegal abortion in France in the 60s, um, the review were a bit mixed. They were saying, oh, this is a small book of, of Arnia. No, she wasn't invited to the big TV show we have in France, usually about books. And... Um, she said, wait, wait, wait. Oh, there's a there's a TV show in France for authors. Is that what it is? Yes, a big TV show called it was called Apostrophe. Now there's no one called the big bookshop. You know, this is oh yeah. wait. So there, there, the show the show was called Apostrophe, but it got canceled. Is it done? no? Canceled, but the the, the Bernard Pivot was a big. Um, it was a journalist who was uh, you know uh, hosting this great show went on your retirement and now there's a new TV show called La Grande Librairie, the big big shop. Oh, and we okay, still okay. have a literary TV show in France every every week on national TV, oh my which is God. wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think American. So needs she to was take always <laughs> invited to this program, and for the first time she was not. And as she, she people thought, well, this is not a big, big big book, and she said, this is my biggest book. This is my most important book. This is a event of my life. I went through life and death because when you have an illegal abortion, you can, you can end up dead. No, you can. So, and she said also that she, when she wrote the book, she, she, she had the abortion. She was looking for a literature about abortion and she couldn't find any, you know, like it's a small subject. It's not a, a worthy subject of literature. And I think this is one of the reasons I wanted to write about because it's not a worthy subject of li worthy subjects of literature, and my aim is to write about everything hidden in my life, everything I'm ashamed I shouldn't be ashamed, um, and put this in the open, put this in literature. So for all this reason, I had to write a seventeen, and I wrote it the first version very quickly, maybe four days, you no. Know? 
And it's funny because the day before uh, I began to write this book, I I didn't even thought I could I, I was going to write it. You know, it was a sudden and um, urgent decision to write it. And it came out fast. Very fast. And then four days like this, and it's very it's quite short, you know. And uh, then I rewrite. I, I, I'm a big rewriter. You know, I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite because I want that the sentences are very clear. Uh, there's not an extra word. So this is my work to do uh, after. I did the first version. And so when, like, the, I think there's a key distinction to make between the abortion that Annie Erno had in her youth and writes about. What's the name of her book? Is it The Happening? The, the happening. In English, it's Happening. Yeah, Happening. Okay. In French, it's L'Evénement. Okay. And so when she had that abortion, I think you mentioned it, it was illegal. Yes for her to have that abortion. When you had an abortion in the, the center of Paris, in the left bank in 1984, I believe it was, yeah. the spring of 1984, it was easy to get yes, the very. procedure done. And yeah. you, you write in the book, in all of history, has any 17-year-old girl ever had so much freedom? Yes. And it's a good point because mm -hmm. you really were among the first young women in the world Yes. To have access to uh, abor an abortion at that age, like prior to what, the 1960s, uh, prior to, what is it, the, how do you in say France, her name? Uh, the law is 1974. The vile law, or how do yeah. you pronounce it? Loi Veil, Veil, Loi Veil, Loi Veil. Simone, Simone so Veil. It was 10 years. It was 10 years. But I could have a sex life, I could have the pills, I could have an abortion, and I knew all the privilege I have. Uh, Annie Arnaud didn't have any of this privilege, um, and when, and when um, the, it's illegal to have an abortion, you won't uh, prevent women to have an abortion. They will, anywhere they will break, break the law, you know. Um, and this is what's happening in, in in your country. Young women have to break the law, and breaking the law is dangerous. It's dangerous for your health because you can have many as issue because of because of a, um, illegal abortion and you can be I, I was in brazil a few months ago to speak about abortion i bought this book was translated and in brazil abortion is illegal there's no way you can have an abortion you cannot go to another state so when you reach you go to a clandestine clinic but when, when you are poor you you can kill yourself you know um you take any any means to abort to end your pregnancy and many women are dying about abortion so it's mainly a health issue because you cannot forbid women to have an abortion they will have if they want to they will be too desperate to have a baby they don't want to when they are not ready to be a mother and so they will have an abortion and they will kill themselves yeah, it's dangerous. And mm. this is what she was doing. Yeah. And yet you just walked into a clinic in yes. the, le the left bank of Paris and mm. it was kind of a non-event. It just happened. It happened it quickly. Have. I thought that when I was six, 17, I thought it would be not non-event. I, I will not think about it later. Um, and then, of course, I did think about it. But the, maybe the you, you were talking about the way that I... I I felt so much my freedom, you know, I was a young woman, I could have a sex life, uh, I had the blessing of my parents, I was so, you know, so free. But the thing is, when I became pregnant, I was furious, because I was raised with the idea that men and women were equal. They could have the same sex life as the body of my age, you know, like careless. And I realized it was not true. I had an uterus, and I could be pregnant, and could be a toll on my life. And no one told me that. Or maybe they told me that, but they don't want to hear. You know, I want to be the equal of the men and the boys of my age. I didn't want to be someone with an uterus and have to be uh, taken care. I should have to be careful about it. You know? I remember I hated, I hated to have my menstruation. I hated to take the pills. I wanted to be free like a boy. And I realized I was not. And you mentioned your upbringing and your, like the expectations you were given as a child, 
you were born into a very progressive post 1968, mm -hmm. like left bank Parisian culture. Mm -hmm. Your parents were very progressive in their politics. I believe they had an open marriage. Which... Not, but my, my father was open, but not my mother, you know? Uh, yeah, right, yeah, right. So it was, but it was, it was new, like this kind of progressive politics and this kind of progressive approach to raising children was a bit new, right? They felt, I think your parents and other parents of that time in that place felt like they were giving their kids new freedoms. Yes, and the, a, best. A new, the best. The best, the new, yes. new, new sense of possibility. And then when you get pregnant at age 17 and you have this abortion it sort of shatters the illusion, right? It breaks this idea that you had of yourself and it changes your relationship to your body, right? You, like, yes. what, how did you, can you well, talk about that change? Yes. I realized suddenly I have an, I have an uterus, you know, I have a female body. I thought before I was neutral. You know, I, I could be myself, the unique myself. And then suddenly I fell in the jail of the female body. That means I have a choice and my life now will be not to be getting pregnant for years and be careful. Then when I reach my 30s, to be pregnant, to have children and to get married because this is the, the project of my life. And I, I, um, and I couldn't escape it, you know. Uh, I would. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a writer. I have other dreams, but I felt suddenly that I have to respond to the object of my uterus, and I had to be a mother. And this has to be the principal goal I had in life. And this was the only way to be happy. Hey. Um, and I remember how furious I was at the beginning. You know. Uh, um, I think all the privilege of my education, the freedom, uh, the liberal pa progressive parents. Um, you know, in France, uh, when uh, you you le ou la, you know, you have feminine or masculine word, but just we say that uh, il uh, le the man the um, masculine is neutral. You know, it's not a question of feminine or masculine. The masculine is neutral. So I choose this was true. Masculine was neutral, and I was neutral. And I realized, no, that's not true. No, that's not true. That's a, tr that's a trick, you know. Um, and it took me years to escape from that, from my, um, from this female body, you know. Um, I thought, and I, I talk about it later in friendship, but because maybe I had education, I had diploma, um, I would escape the trick of my gender and I would be more free than any other woman. In, fi in fact, no. Um, I was cooked up by my body for years and years. And I mean, you can't, can you ever really escape your body? Is it even possible? I, I don't think I escaped my body, but I learned how to use it. But I, I, it took me years. It took I was fifty to understand that my body was very interesting, that I could do something with my body, and I um, this this went through swimming, through sport. You know, in my very liberal and progressive education, uh, sports was not something to talk about. It was not something very interesting. Uh, you had to read books and have diploma, but making sport was something a bit idiotic. You know, your body has nothing to teach you. And late, though, I was 50 when I learned that uh, swimming gave me, gave me a lot of strength, but not in a muscular way, but for my mind. And um, that my gesture in swimming was smart and could uh, teach me things about myself and the person I was and help me uh, to make decisions, help me to find a way in life. And... Um, not escape my body, but use it in the best uh, way I could. And in that way, give me some, a lot of strength. And much more stronger now, I'm 57. I'm much more stronger now than I was at uh, 25 or 30. No? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I talk to writers all the time mm -hmm. who have an exercise regimen of mm -hmm. some kind, and mm -hmm. it helps them creatively. Yeah. I'm that way. I think it helps you emotionally. It helps me 
stay sane. Yes, very much. It helped me in my writing. For instance, uh, I'm, I'm writing, I'm doing freestyle. And freestyle, you learn to to abolish any gesture or things where are useless to, to go move forward, you know. So you have to be very precise and exercise to, to, to remove anything which is useless. And then I do that in my writing. I have to, I like to have very fluid sentence, you know, that there's no extra comma, extra word, extra ex expression, nothing pretty, nothing, you know, and uh, uh, the swimming helped me to do that, to reach that. Yeah. And you get to, like, in terms of like this book and it's, it's, it's a meditation on the body, on your body. Mm -hmm. And we start with the novella about the abortion, 17. And there is then this uh, novella called Friendship, which is about the death of the body of a friend of yours and about mm -hmm. the inevitability of mortality and yeah. the de the decay of the body. Uh, is that right? Is that what you were up to in that one? Are there other things that you were doing in that in that novella? Well, you know, you told at the beginning that there's always a secret in a, a book it was, or something you you realize that the book is over when you finish it. And one of the things is we were two women, two girls talking about boyfriends and husbands and lovers. And we didn't realize that we had this um, very strong relationship together. And friendship is something we, there's not many books about friendship. We don't speak so much about friendship. Like it would be a lesson relation and the big, huge relation is a couple, is love. And I realized that the couple and love, there's many rules about it because society church political power social power have um made some norms about the couple because we are making babies we're making money we um we have to follow certain rules for instance when you're a couple you have to you will have lunch every sunday with your mother-in-law you will uh, have to share a bedroom you have to call each other every week or make love uh, every once or twice a week fine no uh, for friendship, there's no rules. I have friends, childhood friends. I haven't called them for last this year because, you know, they're living away because for whatever reasons. And I know I will call them back and it will be like that. If you do that with your lover, you will think you're crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, there's no, in friendship, there's no, it's a very free relation. Uh, but it's, doesn't mean it's not less strong than to being in a couple. So I like to write about that. I was happy to to to, to um, own a friendship. And the other, and you mentioned death. Um, we never have a conversation about death. You know, like abortion. That is a taboo. And now, f when my friend was very sick, she, she knew she was going to die. You know, she, she knew it. She, she had no escape. But around her, the doctors would say, um, you know, they would never use the word death. They would say, um, vital signs. Um, they would say, always say, oh, there's some, some hopes, you know, we can do that and we can do that. They will, and we need to have a talk about death because we're going to die. And when you, because you don't speak about it, um, death becomes savage, you know, something huge was going to happen, but you don't, you, you, you ignore it. You can't ignore death. And I remember the uh, last conversation we had together, uh, last talk, we were in a, in a cafe and, and she was very, very anxious because she knew she had a, a week to leave. You know, she was at the end of her life. And I was very anxious too because I knew we had to talk about that. And, it's a difficult talk to have, very difficult. And I remember she, we began to talk about it and then suddenly she noticed a man in the room, in the cafe, and said, oh, this man is cute. And began to talk about sex and love. You know? <laughs> and she's I a week quite, of, I was I'm, quite happy to escape, this, to escape um, this talk I didn't want to have. Uh, but I was also happy for her because until the, the end, she lived and she had desire. And she was out at a cafe a week before she died. 
Yes, ten days maybe. Yes. Very sick. She must have not been feeling well. She, she, you know, the awful thing about cancer sometimes is it's heightened. You don't see the person is going to die. It's heightened. There's another talk about that I had with another friend was who died of a cancer and she knew she was going to to die and we had a. I went to see her at the hospital a few days before she died. And of course, I was very nervous. I didn't want to go and speak to her, but she was a very strong woman and she wanted to speak about her, to say adieu, to say goodbye to the person she likes and she loved. And I remember entering the room and I was so afraid. And she was very chic, makeup and a very nice pyjama with no wrinkle. And she, we, she began to speak about her death, her soon death. And what kind of funeral she wanted to have, and the regret she had because she want she would love her husband very much, and she wanted to have a few years more with her, but she was at peace. And um, we say goodbye. She told me that she was happy to meet me, and and I was I said to her the same, and I felt a huge sense of appeasement. Well, this is not the frightening thing that you can imagine. It can be like that, you know. And you have less fear of death after witnessing me? Of course. Much less. No, I'm not afraid of death anymore. I want to live for, for uh, another few years. I have things to do. But I'm not afraid of death anymore because of this friend. And because I think that she, she gave us a huge gift. Because she, what? She just faced it. She didn't. She faced it, you know. Death was here. And when you're going to die, you have to say goodbye. You know, before, uh, when you were a Catholic, uh, there were, um, uh, you, before dying, you had prayer and you were saying goodbye to your family and the family was around you. And now uh, this kind of tradition is disappearing. You know, yeah, this, the, the um, family grouping uh, around a, a deathbed. Now we kind of try, ignore it, you know. Like we said to the person who is going to die, well, you can make it, you know, we lie. Um, I don't think that's a very good idea to lie. Well, these, the death of your friends that you just described, are not, it's not the only deaths in the book. I feel like the loss of your parents is very much a part of all of these stories. It, f it filters throughout the book. Mm. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you had a... a relationship with your mother that was not affectionate. She was not a hugger. <laughs> there was not, not a lot of affection, but she did love you. I think you yeah, knew yes. that you were loved, but she didn't know how to express it. Uh, whereas your father, I think, was warmer and had an easier time expressing his affection for you. And his the relationship that you had with him was special. Yes, very much. Um, Yes, as I told my mother was, I think she never left the covenant where she was in hiding as a, as a young girl. And I can't remember my mother touching me or giving me a kiss. And my father was very affectionate by the day. I was quite young. I was, he was, uh, I was 23. And, um, you, you were 23 when he died. Yes. And I think my, I kind of much a solitary, uh, life when he died. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. What, what was it? Uh, uh, well, just the, how did these deaths affect you? Because if the, the deaths yeah, of your the deaths you of know, your friends took away your fear of death, did your you, you, did you your know, parents' think, death do the same? I, I, yeah, I think I wouldn't become a writer if my parents were still alive. Um, they're both quite quite young, and I was young myself, and they with all the silence, without but, saying anything to me to what happened to them. They didn't tell you? Never. And you were an yeah, only, I, were, you, were you an only child? No, I have a brother and a sister and they didn't say anything to them either. My mother once told me a little thing when I was pregnant with my first child, but I remember I wasn't ready to interrogate her. You know, I was afraid of what, of her past. So she died a year after and it took me a few years but I began to write and to research and to understand what happened and what was the past of my family and my own childhood. And in 
And this story is hiding every book I'm writing. Even if I want to escape from it, I want to, to write about something else and to separate myself. And um, it's always there. Yeah, you can't get away. No. I would, t- <laughs> I would be happy to, you know. Yeah, I know. Every, but everybody, I think, has yes, some, ver- some yeah. version of that. Everybody has. Everybody has, of course. And you write in the third novella mm-hmm. about a romantic relationship. Mm-hmm. And this is the kind of death of a relation. This is a death of an intimate relationship, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there was a divorce prior to this. You were married, you had children, then you divorced, and then you fell in love with this man uh, in the book Mm -hmm. is named Gabriel. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this is when you started swimming. Is this how you got into swimming? Yes, yes. Um, When you told me about autofiction, a fiction, and... And this is interesting because when you fall in love with someone, you make a fiction of himself, of the person you fall in love, you know. You you give him, give the person's huge qualities. Uh, you make a character of it, you know. You, you fill, up, fill him with all the things you desire, you know. And then it takes you years to realize this is what's fiction. He, he might be a very charming man and loving and funny and... Um, but it's not this very huge character, this, uh, um, you admire a person, you make him bigger than he is in real life. You, when you fall in love, you really a writer of fiction. You, you are your own novelist. So this is how I realized years after, uh, when I finished the book. I, 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 I told you how I, I wrote this swimming story. Uh, I, 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 it's not a story I wanted to write, you know. I, I was supposed to write a nice love story. I had this idea. I thought, this is a new idea. <laughs> uh, I'm going to write about a, a loving and nice love story, you know. Usually in books, love stories are ending in nightmare. But me, I'm going to write a nice love story. with A, a, nice a happy, movie. a happy love story. A happy love story, <laughs> because there's not never enough. Like, it's a great idea I have. And I signed a contract for the book with my publisher, and then... Suddenly, this love story fell apart, and I have to write about it. And it was very hard because I was crying. I have to go back to my nice souvenir and write about them. How he was loving and charming, and he was not there anymore. You know, so every day I had to write about it. It was quite hard. Uh, I wanted to escape from it and not to think about it, and so I had to write about it every day. And because it, because you were under contract. Yes, and then. <laughs> And I had a book to a book to write, and and to save myself, I uh, I would I would go to the swimming pool every day. I didn't think about it, but you know when you're in despair, where your heart is broken, you cannot think anymore. So this was a way not thinking and do something. And to go to the swimming pool, you don't have to think. You take your bike, you take a bicycle, you go to the swimming pool, you put your swimming po- uh, suit on, you go in the water, you call, and you have a shower. Okay. So I would do that, not thinking. But after a few weeks, I realized I'm a very anxious person. I'm someone who would think too much. And I felt much more, I was, uh, I felt happy. And I was surprised, you know. My heart was broken, but I was happy. And I, I was the first surprised. No one told me that my body would bring me some happiness and some sense of relief and peace. And, um, and that's how I began to write a book about swimming, you know. So I thought I would write a book, a book about love. In fact, it became a book about my body and swimming. Yeah, and you would, I mean, this, Gabriel, uh, you guys began swimming together. Yes, I would bump into him in the swimming pool. It was kind of the trick. You know, I, I, I was trying to escape from him, but we met each other in the swimming pool, and it would give me some swimming lessons. Which, And I was still hoping that we'd go back together. So it was... A way to be together in the swimming pool, you know, we are swimming along and he would give me advice, look at me, very, be very kind. But I couldn't escape because he was still there, you know, and it took me very years and I have to finally had to find another swimming pool. It took me years <laughs> to escape really from him. But I mean, but that, you guys did, you guys, did you guys, when you were, when you were together, hmm? is that when you started swimming? And yes, then... he was the first one who told me but that, you, you know, you have a body. You know, you cannot escape and ignore your body. And um, and he was 
a sportsman and he would go swimming and do other things and I would go with him to do something with him. So at the beginning, it, 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 and uh, but I like it very much. And then after you break up, mm-hmm. you decide you decide to keep swimming, and you yes. would still and you would still see him at the pool. That's what the way you know to to to, to still have in my life, um, not to have a real breakup, and to uh, first maybe I would. I think I did. I would do it for him, but very quickly understand. I understand. I did it for myself. Because first, I would see him in the swimming pools once in a while, but you know we never didn't have an appointment to go swimming together. We bump into each other by accident, so it, it became very quickly my things, and not his. It was my my project. Yes. And are there a lot of swimming pools in Paris? There's many very nice swimming pools in Paris. Yes. Okay. You know, with my sister, we did a project with. There's 46 public swimming pools in Paris. So you went to swimming in every swimming, different swimming pool in Paris. What's the What's your favorite one? Will you say? Ah yes, oh, there's many I like very much. I think the favorite one I like a swimming pool from the nineteen twenties. They look like big church, very uh, hairy, very uh, lots of lights, and there's one called La Butte aux Cailles. It's a beautiful one. Wh- which Aaron, uh, which arrondissement is that in? A thirteen arrondissement. Oh. Okay, and it's called the Butokai. La Butokai. So next time you go to Paris, you should go and swim there. Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, it's open. I guess. No, it's it's you pay a small fee, of maybe three euros or two dollars, and you you can get in. Well, it's it's just when you're in a city like you're in New York right now, yeah. you know there are pools, hmm? but they're all inside somewhere usually. Yeah. And so they're hidden. Like I've been to Paris. I had no idea there were 46 public yeah. swimming pools in Paris. I, they're, in, they're usually indoors inside of old buildings. And- yes, but you, you, can, you can, you know, it's public. You, you, you can see them from outside. It's, you know, it's, um, it's for everyone, for everyone. It's open. Hmm. And you've spent your whole life in Paris. Yes. You love it. I was it. born there. I was educated there. I went to college there. Well, yes, I'm living. Uh, yes, I'm French. I'm Parisian, Yes. At how much? How like, how much do you feel like it's changed over the course of your lifetime? Not so much, you know. Not so much, strangely. Um, you know, the buildings are the same. There's many shops and bakeries and I don't know cheese shop that were there when I was growing up. The same gardens, the same. I still have my friends from you know. It's um, um, it's not like here you don't destroy buildings, so it really looks the same, yes. Um, you have new cafe and some cafe are closing, but uh, new people are arriving and new families, but um, it's very much the same. You know, I'm not blasé when I'm in Paris. I'm still amazed by the city. I'm on my bike or I'm walking and I'm looking around at that one. I'm living here. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it, yes, it's beautiful, yes. It re- retains, like you say, the, like it, the history of the place uh it holds like in a place like in in a place like los angeles they're always tearing things down putting you know you know you know i i was born in paris but from immigrant parents you know my 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 mother was uh born in paris too but her parents were coming from lithuania from russia my father from uh, transylvania and um so growing up and I, i i i wrote about this in friendship I think I wasn't really the real French person like my friend Eloise. You know, I was this foreigner, this Jew, this someone from somewhere somewhere else. And um, uh, I think I became French through, and I regret it. I wanted to be the real French person, you know. I, I, I didn't have roots, and there was so much silence about the rest of my family. So I didn't know where I would come from. And I remember I was reading the phone book to find like information about identities about my, you know, members of my family, um, because there were so many phantoms. But um, I think I really became French and Paris through literature. It's as a reader that I became this real French Parisian person. And what were the books? Like, what were some of the books that you read? <laughs> there were really... so many, so many books, you know. I'm, um, uh, the one I was reading as a child or today? As a child, like where did you start that really like set uh, you on your course? They have a wonderful uh, collection in France of what's called Legends, Counts, Counts et Légendes from all over France, from all, all parts of France. I remember I loved to read that. 
euh, contre les jeunes femmes burgundies, contre les jeunes femmes britanniques, contre les jeunes femmes euh, Alsace. Euh, what, 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 what is the word? Contre les... Contre les jeunes... Euh, legends. Uh, legends. Oh, so it was like for when tales. you were a child. Legends, when you were... and, uh, legends and tales. I will... And there's another, there was another book um, uh, like of two little boys uh, uh, walking all over France because I love set pounds, all over France and going everywhere in France and visiting every place in France by themselves. Uh, um, I remember I love that. Um, but I remember I love Colette. Uh, as a, or Marcel Pagnol, he was a, um, a French writer from Provence, from the south of France, and he was writing about his childhood in, in Provence, and, uh, and I remember loving that. So it's really, I made my French education through, through literature. And you went to, what is it called, SIPO? Uh, what is it called, the, the college that you went to? Ah, my school, yeah. It's, called, it's, it's a very a special school in France called Alsacian School, from Alsace. It's a part of France. Um, That's where my a, grandmother, my grandmother's from Alsace. Ah, yes. Yeah. So it's Protestant. It's not a, a Catholic, it's Protestant. So um, the education was much more liberal. We would do sport. Uh, boys and girls would be t together, not like other private schools, which are more a Catholic school, which are, the rules are very different. So the Alsacian school in Paris was, uh, you had a lot of, artists and it was very progressive and it was a school when you could make mistakes uh, you know as a French education system is quite normative this one was very um, more American in some way you know, but that was like that was like high school right that was yeah, like yeah. the equivalent I went to this school from the age of six to the age of 17 you know so and I then all my education there and for university you went to I went I studied in Paris. Uh, you know, uh, I went I studied law and political science in Paris. So I studied uh, right, yeah. Law and political science. Yes, in Paris, yeah. But what was the name of the school where you studied law and political science? It's called Sciences Po. Say again. Sciences Po. Sciences Po. Sciences Po, yes. Okay, Science so po. who did I talk to? I want to say I I talked to an um Oh god, I'm totally blanking on her name. A French author Parisian, she's Moroccan. Leila Slimani. Leila Slimani. She Leila went to, Slimani, did, she went to Sciences Po too, yes. She yeah. did, okay. So yes, I'm thinking, yeah. that's it. She was telling yeah. me about Sciences Po. Yeah. And I want to say she studied law and political science or something like that yeah. when she yeah. was there. Yeah, to the same, yes. That's where politicians go. That's politician, but you, it's one of, you know, in, in French, when you go to college, it's quite specialized. You study law or mathematics or literature, and you don't have college like you where you can study anything. And Sciences Po is one of the rare place you can study history and you can study law and you can study economics and philosophy. So it's a nice school to, college to go because you have like uh, quite a range of, uh, of study you can do. And that's in, is that, that, that is on the left bank as well? I'm yes. Trying to... Yes, in Paris, Paris, yes. Saint Germain. Saint Germain, yes. Okay. So and I, so, didn't really, I didn't really. It took me years you not know, to escape to my neighborhood, to Saint Germain, and the place I, I, I was educated. But I was finally able to leave. But it's, it's such a nice place. It, you know, it's not the kind of place you want to say. I would. I want to go and escape and live and to have my own life. I, I, I will never go back. You know, it's so nice. You want to stay, and it's kind of a jail. So. Also, so it took me years, and I, but I was able to do it and to leave Saint Germain, even oh. if I live close by now. But I, <laughs> I, I was going to say, do you still live on the left bank? <laughs> yes, I still live. I, 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 I went to the right bank, living there for ten years, and I live in New York too. But I, yes, I, I went back to my childhood. Yes, yeah, I mean, there's worse places to be. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Okay, so. You study law and political science at Sciences Po, mm. and then you end up in literature. Can you talk about, like, you obviously did not become a lawyer or a politician, no. right? So no. Um, I was a reader. I was always a reader. My thing was to read books in life. As soon as I, I, I learned how to read, I was reading. I read all the time. And... But writing for me, which is the obvious thing, I think reading and writing is the same. It's the same act. Uh, I think for me was out of reach. I think when my father died, I, I lose some confidence. 
And uh, I think I didn't know how to write anywhere when I was in Sciences Po. Like you said, um, my teacher would say, my professor would tell me, well, my style wasn't good enough. I didn't know how to write a dissertation or something very, uh, you have norms and you have construction to do. My writing is going like that. So when you have to do a paper, uh, they say, well, see, Colomb, you, you, your mind is not going well. You know, your mind is not uh, very uh, square, you know. So I thought I didn't know how to write, so I went, I became a journalist and I became, I wanted to be a, a I wanted to write to, to write, but the same, uh, I, I did internship, but you don't know how to write, you know, I thought I didn't know how to write. And so I became a TV journalist for years and I became a writer. Uh, wait, you, you became a TV journalist? Yes. For 15 years in France and I had some success and I had a, a TV show, I was a, and, um. I began to write by accident, you know. Writing book was, I, I didn't even think about, dream about it. I think it would be too far away from me, you know. I didn't, I think I didn't know how to write, I didn't have the skill, I didn't, have, I didn't know how to, anything to write about. And, and um, so it was an accident who made me write. Um, kind of, um, I, I I, I remember I had a, someone from a magazine, an editor from a magazine asked me if he, he wanted to write some essays for the magazine and I, I, I was quite successful on television. I said, I can't because you know, I don't know how to write and I have nothing to write about. But I came home, my children was, it was a Friday afternoon, my children were at school and I took my computer on my legs and I began to write a story because I was very, very hungry, hungry against her. Uh, uh, about my grandmother. You were angry about your grandmother? Yes, I was angry with my grandmother. So I began to write about her. And I had many funny stories about my grandmother. My grandmother. And I remember saying, well, maybe I don't know how to write, but it's such a pleasure to write about her. About my it was quite easy. And um, and this, this little writing I did on my corner became a book but it took me a long time and it was like a um it wasn't a decision i made I, it's like i was i'm going to try to do something maybe it's it's not going it's going to be nothing maybe it's going to be a book but i don't know i'm going to do it and we we'll see what's going to happen and what book did that become it became my first book and um I remember when I, I, I began to write about my grandmother, I, I wrote other essays and tried to do things. And one of the essays was published in the French Daily. And, um, and uh, I was, so I was working for this TV station and there were um, uh, quite a famous French uh, publisher who was coming there and he was doing some reviews about books. And he told me, you know, I saw your little essay in the French Daily. It's not bad, you could write a book. And I was very surprised because it wasn't my idea at the time. And he told me this incredible sentence. He told me, you know, I, I, because he saw I was so amazed. He told me, you know, I can have anyone write a book. And I thought, well, anyone is me. So maybe I can do it. And he gave me some very good advice. And uh, to be very simple, to put some suspense. And also that this idea that, when you have an idea of a book, you have a project, there's always something hidden between that you don't want to see because you're afraid of it. And the, the idea was my project was to write about my grandmother. And I told him like it was nothing, that it was a small a detail in the book. You know, my grandfather, the husband of my grandmother, died in 1949. He was murdered. And it was a big scandal in France because in all the newspaper, they said, Monsieur Schneck, Mr. Schneck, my grandfather, uh, was cut into pieces, put in a suitcase by his lover who murdered him. Yes. And you look at me like you look at me and say, Colomb, we don't care about your mother. We're going to write about that. <laughs> but I was so, in my mind, so, I don't know. I, I was afraid of this story, you know, because no one told me about it. I, I discovered it uh, reading a glossy French magazine called Paris Match hidden in the um, office of my father after his death. So, so this, know, and this was, this was your father's father who was murdered? Yes. yes. So cut into, cut into pieces. Well, I discovered it wasn't the case, but it was in the newspaper. It was written like that. So, so what happened? 
Mm -hmm. What? So, so what actually happened? But I actually want to know. Well, uh, it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> uh, what happened is um, my grandfather and his friend disappeared, so they, they thought it was a, a, gay, a, a gay love story. But in fact, they were friends, and, and they have a dispute, and the um, other guy killed him with a um, gun, and he disappeared. And uh, all the story was made up by, by journalists, policemen, like they are, you know, that we all write fiction, in fact. We all see things. For instance, have testimonies in the newspapers of people seeing a suitcase, this man with a suitcase with some blood. But everything was made up, you know, everything was something, you know, we, we, we speak now about fake news. It was fake news. That people thought it, it happened. They saw the, the suitcase, they saw some drip of blood. But in case it was not, nothing, it was an invention of their mind. And we do all do that, you know. We show something, but it's a fiction. You have a very interesting family history. Yes. That's why I had so many books to write about. I was going to say, I mean, this is a, this is a rich history. It's a <laughs> sad history, but it's, there's a lot there. And I would imagine that the trauma, I mean, your father must have been traumatized by this. Very much. He was 18 at that time. And, you know, he just escaped the war. As a uh, Jew child, he just escaped the war. No, he, he was into hiding. He lost members of his family. He was, you know, he was uh, stripped of his name and he couldn't go to school anymore to go to the gardens because he was a Jew. He was a paria for four years in France. And then he just escaped from the war. He survived. And then four years after that, his father died. He's murdered. And it's all the French newspaper. And, um, so my father was very traumatized, but you would see him. He, he was a very charming man, always smiling, very generous. He would hide, hide all his trauma in the very huge smile. As people sometimes do. Yes. Mm. So what's interesting to me about this book of yours is how it's broken into these three discrete sections, these three novellas. And yet, I want to say the subtitle of the book in the English edition is that it's this, what is it? Swimming in Paris, A Life so Story. My, my Life in Three Stories. My Life in Three Stories. And that's how it feels when yes. you read it. Yes. Even though each section is about a discrete part of your life, I think when you take them in the whole, like in the aggregate, it really does feel like I'm reading somebody's life story. There's so yeah. much in here and it's so mm. rich. Uh, I would imagine that that effect is something that you arrived at almost as it was done. Like, did you, you did, did you start with a vision of this book as these mm. three parts or did you kind of just feel your way through? Not at all. You know, it wasn't a, a literary project. It was an accident. You know, you, I, I wrote the first 17 very quickly thinking, well, I have to write about the abortion because I need to, to fight for abortion right. And uh, I didn't even think it would become a book because it's so small. And when it was published, I think one would be interested in this story. It became quite a success in France. And then I wrote the other stories with a breakup, saying that, you know, uh, uh, um, how do you say? <laughs> when Sad, you... crying. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and I wrote the other story, Swimming, and I didn't think about, you know, it was another small book. And I, I, I thought to myself, well, I have to write it. I have my contract, but um, I was sad writing it, and I, I didn't want to know anything about this book. You know, it's like okay, I finish it, and then I will put it away in the dustbin. I will fall in love with someone else, and I don't want to to speak about it anymore. And the third book was, you know, my friend died, and she was this discreet and wonderful woman, and no one would speak about her. And her mother told me, her mother told me once, you know, no, no one speak about to me about my daughter anymore because people are so much afraid of death. And there was a child is, is dead, it's, it's worst. So I had to write it so she would exist somewhere. And the three books were published differently in France. And I know you told me at the beginning there's a secret of a book, or, or books are alive in themselves. And then you put the book together, it became another book. Right. And I see how obvious is it. You know, I had this project, but I didn't know about it, you know. Uh, 
No, I see it's very current. I see it's a book. But I didn't think about it when I wrote them. It's the publishing of it, you know, the, the, um, yeah, the publishing gave them something more. Yeah. Well, and you, you realize as a reader, once you finish the book, the ways in which these different novellas are speaking to one another. They mm -hmm. feel, even though they're very distinct, they, they definitely feel of a piece and they work well together. Yes. It's, it's, yes, I'm amazed because, you know, I keep repeating the same things, you know. Over and over again, because in each of the story, I go back to my childhood and together. So if I would have a project, I would never have done it like that because it's such a repetition, you know. And I told you, I, I wanted to be, um, I wanted to work as a journalist for big French dailies, but I was writing like that. And you, you, when you read an essay or an article in a magazine, you don't want to have some, some to it, you know like a, a bit of Talmudic way of writing. But at the book, I could do it. You know, I can write again and again and go back to the same facts. It works. Surprisingly, it works. I, uh, I think, but I, I wouldn't th advise someone to write like that. You know, it's not, it's not very um, logic. Efficient. <laughs> yeah, efficient, but it works. Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes the best books start as accidents. Yes, this, they were accidents. And, and, and you know, also I think when you're writing, you should sometimes not to think too much, uh, not try to be smart. Uh, um, you put your intelligence on the side, and not thinking, and you do it, and you will see. It's like a, you have to accept the uncertainty of it. You know, you do something you don't know is going to happen. Maybe you're going to go somewhere. You have a direction, but I realize when I. Arrive to the place I wanted to be. It doesn't work, you know. It's always the book where I arrive some, somewhere else, which are the good books. So yeah, you you write mm -hmm. what like in a in a direction that you don't necessarily know where you're going. I, I have a direction. I think I'm going to write about that. I think I want to write, to write about this nice love story or about my abortion or um, but. I, I arrive somewhere else, somewhere new, somewhere unexpected. For instance, when I began to write about the abortion, I didn't expect that I would write this letter to this child I didn't have. Right. There's a section of that novella yeah. where you are addressing the child that you aborted, mm. the pregnancy that you aborted. And that's a very powerful section where you're speaking directly in the, mm. on the page to that mm. child. Um, and that happens in the writing. That's a creative decision that you make yes. one day when you're sitting. Yes, at the... you don't. You don't decide it. It happens. It happens. Mm. Well, it's a lovely book, and you, you are so now much. you are now in the United States doing yep. a tour. This is your first book to be translated and published yes. in the United States. Yes, the first time. Yes. Okay. Well, I wish you um, safe travels on your tour. Congratulations on uh, swimming in Paris and. Do you have, I always ask people at the end mm -hmm. if they're working on a new book, are you working on anything else right now? I, yes, I'm always working on something, you know. I, but I'm at the beginning of it, so I told you, I don't know where I'm going to, it's going to lead me. But uh, for the moment, I am, um, my character, my Colomb, is, uh, is a, what's called a jeune fille au père, you know, she's kind of a babysitter. I was, when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, a jeune fille au père in a Franco-American family in Connecticut. You were you were no pair in Connecticut at age yeah. seventeen. This is the character of the book. So, and it's going to lead me somewhere, but I don't know yet where it's going to lead me. And Which, it's fi it's fiction. It's part fiction, part uh, yes, it's fiction, and you know a mix of you know I use my little material, you know my life and things which happen and uh, and invent and then mix up and become something I don't know yet. We'll see. Okay. But this is the beginning of it. Okay. Well, it's great to meet you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And uh, I wish you well. Thank you so much. Bye.